All right, great. Awesome. So our next topic is lecture 23, which is mathematics. Um, and I found this chapter to be very, very interesting from a variety of different reasons, because I don't think I had ever really, even as a mathematician, and maybe that's because I'm an applied mathematician, but I don't think I had ever really sat and thought about what is mathematics. And nor had I ever really looked at the five schools of mathematics and tried to figure out which one of those fits me best. But if you can pull up slide, slide deck 23 and go to slide number three, uh, that would be awesome. So mathematics is one of those things that is in the background. We often take it for granted because the numbers just are there. Hamming believes that mathematics is clear thinking, which I think is a very good definition. It's the language of clear thinking. And of course, if you ask me, because I'm a mathematician, you know, mathematics is what is done by mathematicians, and mathematicians are those who do mathematics, obviously, because that's the way that it, it works. But of course, mathematics plays a central role in science and engineering. And, and you know, when we say that mathematics really is, a, is essentially, essentially has only one language, which you can go to the next slide, please. We say essentially because there are equivalent ways to say things, right? So sine x and 2 sine of x over 2 represent the exact same thing. So they're equivalent statements, and we have a lot of equivalent statements in mathematics. The other thing is that, you know, one of the things that I was thinking of as I was preparing for this lecture was, you know, I... I actually had a mission to Afghanistan and worked for the Minister of Higher Education in Afghanistan and had to prepare a 210 question college entrance exam for them as part of the project to build the National Military Academy of Afghanistan. And so the exam was made up in Dari and Pashto. And interestingly enough, although I could not do their you know, their humanities and some of their other questions, I was still able to answer pretty much most of their mathematics questions, even though I couldn't fully read the, the, what the questions were asking for because they were in Dari or Pashto. But from the fact that the numbers were being used and how they were being used, I could almost figure out exactly what they were asking for and answer those questions. So I thought that that came to my mind. You know, there's there's essentially only one language of math. And so then the next slide explains that the foundations of math really depend on which school of thought you're from. You know, I've got a book back here right behind me on the shelf called Foundations of Math. And at no point while I was reading that book did I kind of even consider what is the foundation, you know, does it, which of these schools does it ascribe to? But Hamming then takes some time and actually discusses each of these five schools. Next slide. The first one is this Platonic school or what you might find on Google as Platonism. And this is where the mathematical objects simply exist. Um, they're just waiting to be discovered. And they believe that all of mathematical results are discovered. They're not created. They're not invented. It tends to not be very believable, and it doesn't really explain mathematical evolution, how, you know, how we've evolved in mathematics. Next slide. Formalism is then the next school of thought in mathematics. And here, it's essentially a mechanical process, right? It's a formal game of transformations that are applied to strings of abstract symbols, okay? This is, this is where the AI experts reside, okay? 
there, these transformations are strictly this mechanical process. There's no interpretation. There's no meaning. Things just get manipulated and transformed. Next slide. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip the proof. Go ahead and jump forward two slides, please. And one more. Then we get to the logical school or logicism, right? Which is people who ascribe to this believe that mathematics in its, in its simplest form is simply a branch of, of logic. Mathematical principles are simply derived from a furnished set of true primitive, primitive concepts or true propositions, right? So, you know, and then everything else is logically deduced from that. The logical school you see at the end does not account for the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. And if you are interested, you can actually go out on Calhoun and find an article by Richard Hamming with that exact same title, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics, that is a follow-on article to The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in Nature that was published around 1958, I believe, by someone else. And he's responding to that with his take on the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Okay, next slide, please. Following the logical school of thought is the intuitional school. Next slide. The inti Intuitionists believe that mathematics is a creation of the mind. It's subject to interpretation and adapt adaptation. The postulates of mathematics are human made and therefore they can change, right? So I'm probably in this, as applied mathematician, this is probably where I reside. You know, I, well, first off, I don't like to prove anything, so that I would fall here just for that sole reason. But I tend to see the usefulness in math being more towards what I am going to use it for and, and not just for the sake of having math. And then along with that comes a very closely related final school that Hemming talks about, which is the constructivist school, which is the next slide. And so this is where you construct mathematical objects using reasoning. Um, existence is proved by either the extraction of the algorithms, computation, and or simulation, right? So things are, are built and constructed. Computer scientists fall in this. As Hamming says, they might not know it, but they do, with the exception of the AI folks, perhaps. And it's too strict and, and excludes too much of what we find valuable in practical mathematics, however. So, all right, so those are the five schools. Next slide. Okay. And none of these schools really have been, ever been proved to be general, generally popular or accepted, which is kind of funny because, of course, you know, that's what we're trying to do is prove mathematics is do proofs in mathematics to begin with. But he be Hamming believed that he belonged to the intuitionist and the constructiveness, which in some of the research I did, those two are kind of constructionist is inside the intuitionist in, in some of the philosophy literatures that I was looking at. None of them by themselves can account for what we do and what we've been able to do. Next slide. So Hamming believes that, yeah, so that, that meanings are able to change. And, and so go to the next slide, please. Sorry. Next slide. Sorry. And one more. There you go. Right, and so 
based on his experience, Hamming believed that math the mathematics you choose to use must come from the field it's being applied to. The meaning of a symbol arises, therefore, from how it's used. And symbols mean what we choose them to mean. So in this particular case, when Hamming discovered error correction codes or created, he redefined one plus one to equal zero, where you might have thought that one plus one equals two. And then Gödel's theorem, which of course, you know, everybody has to have a book for that, um, <laughs> Also, you know, has a, is a theory about the discrete symbols and not just math. And so, next slide. Okay, and then there are a lot of things we can't do within the system of a computer. And, but there are a lot of things now that we can do in a computer. And so <laughs> I love Hamming's final thoughts here as we wrap up the mathematics chapter where he says our predecessors did the easy problems and, you know, you're going to be required to do the harder problems our successors will have to tackle the hardest ones. And I, that's probably true today. You know, I don't think the problems that we're facing right now are particularly easy. Okay. They might be a little bit harder than the problems during Hamming's time, but you know, I can only imagine what the problems are going to look like in the year 2055. Right. Okay. Last slide, please. Okay. And so just, to remember that mathematics will not always fit well into every field or problem. What you, the way you define mathematics depends on the application. The, the definitions that you use and the symbols you use also depend on the field of application. The math that got us to the moon won't get us to Mars. It will require new math. I believe we've figured that math out. So the question is what new math is going to be required to get us out of our solar system. Um, and then the last quote there, everything really worth knowing cannot be easily stated. Okay. And then what we'll do is I'll go ahead and Go back to the lecture play page one last time. Okay. And to the next lesson. All right. And I know this was a really quick down and dirty on the mathematics. I did not want to get wrapped up into, into a lot of it, but I did summarize it all right here at the bottom of the lecture page. And I wanted to Focus, and I did link to the article that I held up, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. And then I wanted to, this quote was in his book. We will in time, I believe, want mathematical models in which the whole is not the sum of the parts, but the whole may be much more due to the synergism between the parts. And that got me to thinking, and I don't, I don't have the answers to this, but is there an example or can you give an example of a mathematical model where this statement is true, right? So is there, is there an example out there where the whole is the synergism and not necessarily the sum of the parts? You know, I was trying to think of some of the machine learning models or the na natural language processing models or things like that, you know, because I know a lot of those build one on top of each other and, re, you know, and, and have a series. And I'm wondering, though, if that's, it's not necessarily the sum, but if it's kind of the collection. And is there a synergism there that might be kind of fitting this definition? And I'd have to do more research into that. It's just something I was thinking of. And then at the end of this lecture, Hamming states that we may have to invent new mathematics to face the problems of the future. and so. I got to thinking what are some or what have been some of the problems that we faced that have required these new mathematics since 1955. And once again, not a whole lot of research on that, but I believe if we look into it, some of the developments in 
the network science with page rank and things like that to be able to allow the search engines and things like that and you know and and so i leave those two questions open for everyone to ponder and please leave a comment if you have ideas or thoughts or even other questions that you would like to ask and i'll go ahead and paste these in the chat for everyone to look at michelle here's an indicator on your first question about mathematical model it, the indicator is when people start talking about emergent behavior unexpected interactions or unintended side effects those are manifestations often of multiple models interacting and since they're not in the same composition of a single model that's where understanding and surprise start occur. Go ahead, Marty. Thank you. In, in what is normally a non-mathematical field, group dynamics, the cohort, you've all, you may or may not have heard the following ditty. One can do the work of one. Two can do the work of three. Three can do the work of six. Nine can do the work of seven. Twelve can do the work. <laughs> There's a critical mass number, and it's non commutative math for your consideration. Interesting. Yeah, I, I would say part of, part of the emerging thing, Don, because I, I've, I've ended up over time thinking about some of this stuff. That's, I think that's got more to do with the limitations of what the creators of that program, what they could imagine rather than anything special about the circumstances. I mean, they, they, they just built a system that they didn't understand yet. And to go into that and tie that to the sum of all parts, a computer program is just a bunch of ones and zeros. You can sum them up any way you want. The pile of data that you're going to run through that program is just a bunch of ones and zeros, and you can sum them up any way you want. You can add those two sums together, and they're not going to give you any insight whatsoever into what the results of that program are going to be when you run the program on that data. That that's going to be a dramatically different outcome on what the information is coming on up, but then what the simple information is of the program and what the simple information is of the unconnected chunks of data. So I, I think that makes the statement fairly true right there, really, really, really early in the process. Nice. Yeah, perhaps uh, amplifying that is, uh the constructivist stuff is very interesting. Now, there, I think there's a contemporary connection to that that's less than uh, 10, at most 15 years old, and that computational science. I think you uh, even mentioned that, Michelle. But the notion that sheer power of raw number processing and throw, throws it, if it's well structured, it's it experimental it's a, it's, a, it's a level of experimentation it may not be the real world you may be computing against models of the real world but you can do it in such a massive way computationally that you can run simulated experiments and explore alternatives that frankly aren't even possible in the real world and that you have you know it almost that the scientific method has grown by another size so that's really interesting that the power of raw numbers, computational science is, is maybe those constructivist principles deploying. I agree wholeheartedly. I, I also failed to mention that, you know, after this chapter here, I do have this. I bought this many years ago, right? And I actually have not read it. But now that I did this lesson and read what Hamming had to say about the loss of certainty, and he referenced Klein's book specifically, I guess I should read it now. <laughs>
as well. So, all right. Well, Don, that um, pretty much uh, wraps could it I up. Add, there is one more model, though, that I guess it's your second question. Oh, okay. In mathematics, or it's it's sort of in there, and this is this is a very interesting blend of some of the concepts. The pure symbolic logic was was manifested back in the day, sort of sort of by the theorem provers and the scruffies, the experimentalists and the pure mathematicians, and there's still that, in many senses, a split in a lot of the various branches of AI that are going up. But a really powerful thing, and this took 10, 15 years of a lot of people pounding on it for the terms of reference to get aligned. And I'm thinking specifically of semantic web standards. And there was also first, you know, years of just can we correlate our jargon get our concept aligned, our terms of reference and how we say things. Oh, n-dimensional space, what are our n-dimensions? And then levels of reasoning. And this was informed a great deal by computational theory. There's, I, th I think, two pro programs on television these days that expand computational science to, oh, we can predict all the events in the future because we can predict all events in the past and we can go to an infinite level of detail and we can because if we have a big enough supercomputer we can become omniscient about the future of the universe well if you set aside any religious or philosophical philosophical characteristics of that you get to oh there are theories of there are things that are not not theoretically computable. Computing theory describes what can you figure out and what can't, can't you. And this is not based on speed of processors, but rather what can math actually do? What can we represent? What can we symbolize? How can we reason and perform logic against it? So, Long story short, when they came up with a common denominator reasoning language, most notably OWL, the web ontology language, they came up with not two flavors, but three. The things that are efficiently computable, the next level, things that are computable, just might not be able to tell you exactly how long, but they can be done. And three things that have the potential to be intractable and may not lead to a, for example, you could conduct a search of a space or a search of information and not resolve them. So that's pretty fascinating because the terms of reference were crisp enough that they could not opinionate decide this, but theoretically show the basis for three levels of computability, three levels of reasoning. Oh, so if that question is too hard, change the question. Refactor your question to a level where it's suitable for the computation they have for the problem or to be solved. And maybe if your problem is not solvable, maybe you're trying to solve the wrong problem. Here we are back again at n dimensional space, and have we picked the right factors or not? So that's a fabulous, troublesome question you pose there. My nomination for that for contemporary times would be semantic web standards have reconciled much of theoretical, logical AI with computational practice and roughly experimental AI. Awesome. And I would take all of that and layer it with something that Hamming mentioned in a previous lecture, which was always re-examine the assumptions. There's a whole bunch of things that we say can't be done. And I was almost 
going to jump in and say, be careful, Don, when you're talking about computability and such, because if you follow the math, my dissertation is impossible. The problem with that is that requires the assumption to be the be all end all that you have to have one set of assumptions and you cannot ever do anything to compensate. But if you change the assumption set, suddenly the nice tight proof ends up in a little box in the corner and you can do all kinds of really useful things right. without violating it. You've just described the space on, on how you operate separate from that. There's a tremendous amount of things in the computability. You know, okay, yeah, we, the halting problem. Great. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to say stuff you can't do. All right, fine. I choose to not want to verify every possible program ever made. Suddenly, the halting problem is irrelevant to me because there's at least one program that I don't care about. And so the proof breaks. And, and it's that kind of thing. It's you've got to take a, a look at what those assumptions are and go on. I know I, I was introduced to another part. There's something about some theorem in distributed computing that Lampert has. Now, I'm not doing anything new with that, but it at least let me understand that you can have engineering solutions that do things that these proofs say aren't, po aren't possible because you're not adhering to the very, very tight constraints that are set up in the beginning of this proof. Now, Lampert said a whole bunch of things. Well, if you set it up this way, this way, this way, this way, you can never know what's going to happen. And so, you know, back in the 1980s, engineers said, well, we're just not, we're not going to do that one thing. And then we're going to add this other thing to mitigate the problem. And they did certain things with distributed systems. I'm taking a different uh, tack on a different part of the problem, but it's the same thing. I'm saying, okay, well, I'm going to eliminate a set of assumptions and work in a slightly different problem space. So, you know, Hamming, if you layer a couple of his lectures together, I'll let you start thinking about really wackily different things. Yeah, con constraints are your friend. If you can reduce the problem and maybe shed uninteresting or unmeasurable or unrepeatable cases, suddenly uh, tractability can sometimes snap into play. Old slogan for that is, got on my first boat, actually. We were astonished because the XO said it. Say, well, if you ain't having fun, lower your standard. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Quit trying to solve the too hard problem that is maybe not practical. Constraints are the path. That's the echo I was hearing in what you were saying. Somebody who's walking that walk right now, Lori. Okay, uh, maybe one mathematician social question, Michelle. Mathematics is the language of clear thinking. Math can always give you an answer. It was surprising to me that Hamming put out these five schools. It's even surprising today. It just that, well, mathematics is beautiful, it's perfect. It's mathematical, but just don't tell us how the different tribes coexist or how they fit in because we can't tell you. You know, that that always seems to be somewhat contradictory. I wonder what your take on it was. It I mean it is it is very that's a very great question, Don. And you know what's what's interesting is every mathematician that you meet is different right so every one of them is different i mean when i was at west point in the math, actual math department here at mps i'm in or so i don't get to get surround myself by the math specific geeks here but but at west point i mean 
everybody there had, you know, their, their different areas they're good at. There were pure mathematicians there, you know, they applied mathematicians, the, the ones that love the history of mathematics and the ones that, you know, just really want to see math and how math can be used with computers. And so I don't know how we all coexist, um, but somehow we are, we do. Um, but it makes for some very interesting discussions because when you get them all in the same room and you actually start to talk about things, it's really neat because you do get so many different perspectives as well. And, you know, I've seen quite a few heated arguments that relate back to the foundations and, it, and you can actually see the different schools kind of pools of thought competing with each, with each other in that same room, you know, and so I don't know. I mean, I, maybe I'm just not passionate enough, but I'm not one to fight over the math. I mean, I, I'm going to find the math that works for me and I'm going to use it. That's really where I'm at. And, you know, I, you know, and I leave the, the heavy work on kind of proving where the stuff comes from to someone else. But I can take a paper where somebody writes some really cool math and put it into a computer with the best of them. And that's where I love what I love to do. So. Awesome. Thank you. Back to you. Okay. I think we're uh, last call on the last call. Anything else today? All right. Thanks, Michelle, for a great session. Thanks, everybody. And good luck to those of you in the future who have the harder problems. Have a good day.